On the behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, I would like to thank you for joining today's public lecture with the title, The Relationship of Traditional Arts and Islam in Japanese Culture and the Arabic Written Tradition by Aaron Benchilaki from Elkos Loran Tudo Manyek Yetem University or LT in Budapest. So this is actually a part of uh, Mas Aaron, that's why I call him. Uh, dissertation. Uh, he's writing his uh, dissertation at LT and is going to defend his defend uh, his dissertation next month. And today is a part of his dissertation progress. And today's public lecture will be divided uh, into three segments. The first is the opening. The second is the presentation around one hour, and the third is question and answer session. So uh, in the opening, I would like to inform you that my name is Vidya Smaramurti, and you may call me Mara, and I will be the moderator of today's public lecture. And today's public lecture, Mar Mas Aron will inform us about the aspects of the topic and then the history of arts and Islam in Jaffa. Uh, the third is gamelan and music in general. The fourth is wayang theater. The fifth is traditional dances and will be summed up in the summary part. And then I would like to kindly remind all participants to mute their voice button during the presentation. And we welcome all written questions, both in Bahasa Indonesia or in English uh, in the chat box. And the questions will be discussed at the last session, which is the question and answer session. You are welcome to turn on or turn off your camera during the public lecture. It depends which suits you to your condition and situation. And before question and answer, we will have photo session with all the participants. The committee also provides a certificate. Please note that the link of this E certificate will be given at the question and answer station. So now we continue to, uh, yeah, to the part of discussing about who is Aaron Benchelaki. Mas Aaron, uh, or Aaron Benchelaki, was born on February 22nd, 1988, in Tekes Perhar, Hungary. Mas Aaron, sorry if I have misspelled the city incorrectly, yeah. So during his uh, school years, he was attending many classes, specializing in learning languages, studying English and German respectively. And in 2006, he started attending a post Loran Tuma Dokyet Yetem University or LT in Budapest in the Arabic studies program. So uh, there he learned learning Arabic language, Arabic history and culture, and about Islam in general. He graduated from his bachelor degree in Arabic studies in 2010, before he continued his studies to master degree in 2011, still at LT. However, this time he was attending Islamic studies program. So here he continued to deepen his knowledge of the Arabic language and started to learn Persian and Turkish as well. During his master's studies, he also learned about the history of the wider Islamic world and about the different branches of Islam, including Islamic law, Sufism, and other Islamic sciences. He graduated from his master's degree in 2013. During his master's degree, he received two scholarships, spending some time in two Arabic countries, namely Tunisia and Lebanon. In 2014, he received the Dharma Siswa Scholarship from the Indonesian government, where he spent two years in Yogyakarta as a student of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta or UNY. At UNY, he was studying Indonesian and Japanese language, as well as Indonesian culture. In 2017, he went back to Hungary and started his PhD studies at LT again, and his dissertation is about the connection of traditional Indonesian arts and the religion of Islam, examining both the Indonesian tradition 
and the written Arabic sources. During his PhD, he spent half a year in Yogyakarta, particularly at Universitas Gajah Mada, between 2018 and 2019, for continuing his research. For the better understanding of the written sources, he also learned French, Dutch, and Chinese. So in here, I can see that uh, Mr. Uh, Max Aaron Lackey is extraordinary scholar. And then since 2017, he is working in the Arabic faculty of LP, teaching Arabic language, Arabic history, and Southeast Asian Islam. Since 2020, he's officially recognized as a full-time lecturer at LP. So without further ado, here I present you Mas Aaron Benchelaki. Mongo Mas Aaron. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen first. Yes, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I am Aaron um, Lucky, as uh, we just have heard. And today I'm going to present my topic about the relation of traditional arts and Islam in Javanese culture and in the Arabic written tradition. Uh, this is my dissertation topic. But first, I would like to talk about the new aspects of the topic. Why is my dissertation as something new? Uh, well, everyone knows the stories about relationships between Islam and traditional Javanese arts, so I don't think I have to talk. Uh, so everyone has uh, a picture of it. For example, everyone knows about the Wali Songo, uh, about these legends, uh, about these uh, Im important people. But uh, are these stories true or can we consider them as something historical or are these only legends? We will just look into that uh, in a minute. Indonesia also has a very long tradition of kitab kunings, uh, these books which were used uh, in the Pesant lands to learn about Islam. These books were written in Arabic, most of them were written in Arabic uh, in the Middle East. The relig this religious literature has to be compared with the legends. So uh, my dissertation is new because uh, um, not many scholars uh, did a comparison of these legends and uh, the Islamic law, the fiqh uh, literature and kitab kunings in general. And the other thing is that there's a long story how the relationship of Islam and, uh, and arts changed in Java. And uh, this means that uh, that uh, many, um, so many uh, researchers mainly give like the contemporary view only or just one historical period. Now I'm going to tell uh, the story uh, from the beginning to the end, how this changed. Uh, first of all, the history of art and Islam in Java. In my dissertation is the longest section because actually I'm the first one in my country who is uh, having academic research about uh, Indonesia. So my, most of the people don't really know about this. So I had to write long about it. But here, I only give a short sketch because you are an Indonesian audience. So you, I'm pretty sure you much know about this. So I'm just giving a, a short reminder. Ancient Japanese art, uh, we know very, very little about this, like even before Hindu times. Uh, it most probably was a religious art with medium communicating with ancestral spirits while dancing and dance. Then Indian culture arrives uh, with Hinduism and Javanese art becomes Hindunized. We have the central Javanese periods where artists follow Indian aesthetical standards and the East Javanese periods when a typical Javanese artistic expression develops. Art is always uh, sacral uh, during the Hindu times. Uh, most of the religious ceremonies have an arts performance. And the kings are always the main patrons of arts and the courts are very important for the arts. This tradition you can still see, for example, in Yogyakarta or Surakarta, of course. Uh, then Islam becomes dominant uh, in Java. Uh, this is the age of the Wali Sangha, uh, but uh, we have to admit that uh, we have very, very few contemporary sources about the age of the Wali Sano. Uh, we mainly know this time from legends, which were written uh, generations after uh, the Wali Sano. So we have to be very, very careful uh, when uh, talking about these stories uh, connected with the different Sunans. 
Um, traditional arts uh, become the main means of religious change. Uh, art only, uh, the art which once connected to Hinduism becomes very Islamic in its nature. A new culture, the Santraism appears uh, with Islam, uh, with the tradition of Pesantran and Kitab Kuning. So this is very important. So the Pesantran is the place where people were learning about Islam and Kitab Kuning were these books which they were used. What Kitab Kuning did they use during the time of Damak uh, and Mataram as well, the Mataram Islam? Well, uh, it's mainly based on Shafi'i books. Uh, so uh, Indonesian Islam became Shafi'i Islam. Uh, mainly the most, uh, the two most important uh, authors were Al-Hazali and Abu Shuja al-Isfahani. Uh, but at this time, the corpus was still very, very small. So during the Mak and Mataram, uh, people could not rely on many, uh, many books uh, concerning with Islamic law. The debate between the religious scholars already started around this time. We also know, this, for example, the stories about uh, Kaum Putihan and Kaum Abangan in Wali Sangha and other uh, books also point that there, have to, there was some debate during uh, these times. Okay, um, I have some red dot lines, I don't know why. Uh, so the colonial times had even much more sources. And uh, with the formation of the four uh, great uh, art uh, kingdoms, like uh, centers, an artistic content contest emerges. Uh, this is a rapid development in the number of arts and artists. The so-called classical Japanese arts are out, evolve around this, these colonial times. The Islamic, uh, this new art, well, it's not new art, so it's uh, um, the arts evolved during this time. They are Islamic in the message, but the style is still much more connected to the older, older uh, religion. But the corpus of the Kitab Kuning widens, and here comes at the colonial time, the dominance of an nawawi this very famous uh, scholar from medieval Syria, uh, whose books become really, really widespread in Indonesia, and in, well, we're talking mainly about Java, but in all Indonesia, actually. And uh, he becomes, uh, I think, uh, next to Al Ghazali, An Nawawi uh, became one of the most uh, relied on uh, scholar in the Pesantren. The rift between a traditionalist and modernist Muslims deepen, which just becomes permanent with the foundation of the Muhammadiyah and the Nahdat al Ulama, of course. After independence, uh, the difference between uh, Kolot and modern Muslims uh, grows. Uh, during the years of Ordebar, religion was first pressed, then at the 80s, Islam becomes important for the government too, which coincides with the revitalizing of traditional arts in Indonesia. Muhammadiyah becomes more tolerant uh, during the 80s and, become, and makes peace with traditionalist uh, Muslims, although not joining them, but they make peace. Uh, after the Reformasi, uh, new radical groups uh, appear, uh, let's like uh, I think everyone knows that there has been this uh, FPE which was banned even last year, or we have other groups like HTE or Lashkar Mujahideen, many different groups, uh, which have a much more of a vision which is much more connected to Arabic culture and Islamic hegemony, as we can say. Uh, so the previously twofold discussions became tripartite. Uh, not just traditionalist and modern, but we have traditionalist, modern, and the radical groups. Lebanese arts are still patronized by the big four courts, but of course, it's, they are very uh, popular. Okay, so this is what you already know, I think. And now let's talk about um, the art forms in general, like uh, in, in, uh, in detail. So gamelan and music in general. Gamelan, this is the first uh, important part. According to legends, uh, gamelan came from gods. Uh, and in Hindu times, uh, music was always very important in religious ceremonies for the Javanese. Uh, with its metallic sound, it still enhances a mystical feeling in the audience. So this is undeniable. Uh, many uh, uh, people uh, said that this is true. And uh, of course, according to the legends, Wali Sangha used it to spread Islam. We all know the story, for example, Sunan Bonang, I think he's the most one credited with uh, using gamelan and, and uh, his uh, dakwa. but it's not just him. Almost all of the Sunans are, uh, 
have connections with gamelan. And it's still part of religious ceremonies, just like the old times. Let's say Sekaten, I think, is the most important, uh, where you can see uh, still see the sacred gamelan of the Kraton. Uh, it's a very important part of the, of the ceremony. Its Hindu origins and atmosphere is sometimes opposed by certain religious teachers. So there are people who assert that gamelan should be banned because of its, its, its Hindu uh, origins uh, and because it's a kind of music. Let's see what the Kitab Kunings have to say about it and what was during the time of uh, the Masa Islam the Ma and Mataram in Java. So during these times, uh, there were many kitab kunings used, of course, but the two main kitab kunings were the Ihya Ulum Din from Al Ghazali and uh, At Taqrit Al Fiqh from Abu Shuja Al Isfahani. Well, the At Taqrit Al Fiqh is a very good book, but it has nothing to say about arts in general. So the main, the main. Uh, book we can consult from the earliest times of Islam in Java is the Ahya Ulum al-Din. So let's look into it. So the Ahya Ulum al-Din in general is not against music. Uh, Al-Ghazali in it writes that uh, music is a sum of sounds and sounds alone are not forbidden. Uh, he says exactly that uh, for example animals have sounds which can be very nice, for example a bird, uh, and of course, we cannot uh, forbid an animal to sing. Even at this, uh, uh, also, we cannot uh, forbid people to speak. These are sounds. Music is just the sum of sounds. So the sum of uh, things which are not forbidden cannot be forbidden too. So Al Ghazali says that music is a good thing. Uh, although he had some problems with uh, certain instruments like the rabab uh, or the different kind of lutes in Arabic culture, the cymbal kind of a drum, a kuba is a kind of a drum which uh, gets uh, smaller in the, in the center and wider at the ends. Uh, and the flute, mazami in Arabic, is always very problematic uh, in uh, the Ihya Ulum al Din, but not because of their sound. So as he said, the sound is not a problem. The problem was that in the time of Al-Ghazali, uh, people used these uh, musical instruments for different kind of, let's say, parties where uh, they, people were encouraged to drink alcohol and have uh, unlawful sexual affairs. So that's why he connected with the sound of these special exact instruments with immoral behavior. So he uh, said that these uh, instruments should not be played in any circumstances. He also categorizes music as useful and not useful music. Uh, a music, he says, is not useful if it's only for entertainment. So if you only play music just to feel happy, uh, then it's, it's not useful and it should be avoided, as he says. But, uh, useful, but a music is useful if it has a positive effect in war, for example, like giving morale to the soldiers before a battle, or if it, it is enhancing religious feelings, like uh, during the religious festival, it, it can feel us closer to God or closer to the ceremony of it. Uh, and he said that, uh, that uh, useful music is a very good kind of music. And uh, in, uh, contra in the view of this, we can also uh, think that, uh, according to his book, that Sakatan is a religious ceremony. So accordance with Al-Ghazali, Gamelan is a good kind of music. So the uh, defenders of Gamelan could say that, yes, according to Ahya Harun al-Din, Gamelan is good. But we also have evidence that, for example, that during the time of Mataram, the people were drinking alcohol, uh, brem, uh, during uh, the even the Sekatan feast. So it is forbidden. Uh, so here there was a discussion between the different ulama saying that the, the defenders of gamelan could say that yes it's not uh, it's uh, no it's good because it's religious music and the enemies of this art form could say yes but it leads to drinking so they could uh, have a strong argument against it based on din. in colonial times gamelan developed further with new instruments entering the ensemble uh, some of them are problematic, according to the Ihya Ulum al-Din, 
And it's very interesting and kind of ironic that, for example, the Rebab, uh, it might have entered Gamalan because of Arabic influence, but uh, it was already a problem in the Arabic, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so it's a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, aspect of it. Uh, as I have told, in colonial times, it was uh, mainly an Nawawi's book, the Minhaj al-Talibin, which became the, one of the most important new books uh, in the Pesant al we, from which we can have uh, uh, information about art. Uh, Nawawi also says, uh, uh, in accordance with al-Ghazali, that there are useless instruments and, and useful instruments. Uh, he says useless instruments are forbidden to be played, sold, or inherited. So he's kind of against uh, this kind of uh, uh, music. But he also uh, stated that those which are useful, as he wrote it in the book, uh, in Arabic, he said they are allowed to be sold, inherited, and played. So in this, uh, he is in uh, accordance with Al-Ghazali. But while Al-Ghazali is only talking about the music, uh, and Nawawi is already talking about the instruments by themselves as well. He also states that a witness in, in a lawsuit is not credible if he often plays the lute, the cymbal, the flute, or often listens to musical saying, while the tumbu, which is a kind of a lute, can be allowed during celebrations, the kuba, which is a kind of a drum I've just discussed, it's always forbidden. So this means, um, uh, this, this means that uh, um, even singing or, or listening to music can be uh, condemned uh, on, in the base of the minhaj al-Talibin. Uh, so we can say that Al-Ghazali in general is more strict about uh, what uh, people could play or what people could listen to, but he still allows the useful music, while useless or even harmful music, which leads to immoral behavior, that's of course forbidden. So he is mainly in accordance with Al-Ghazali, but a bit more strict. Uh, we can see that Gamelan had even more forbidden instruments like uh, the flute, you know, the, there's suling, yeah, there is kacher, uh, or there is rebab in the Gamelan. Uh, and uh, this uh, could uh, give serious uh, concerns for the more strict uh, kiais. And drinking, as we know, still didn't cease during festivals, like uh, even the Sultan of Jakarta was drinking wine during Sakatan. So uh, this could be a very strong opposition against Gamelan during colonial times. But on the other hand, uh, for the people who wanted to protect Gamelan, it could be still categorized as useful music, strengthening religious feeling or preparing the soldiers to war. So uh, the discussion did not really change, but uh, the arguments uh, became wider. In the 20th century, the Pesan fans and Kiai start to rely on the Hadith literature. Well, this is very interesting because uh, Hadith uh, is uh, one of the basis uh, of uh, Islamic law. Uh, and in Indonesia and in Java, they were only started to look to these Hadiths at, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. So it's very interesting. But according to these, even more instruments could be forbidden. Like the flute is always in connection with Satan. Uh, stringed instruments in general, ma'azif, as uh, it said, are always forbidden, uh, according to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, on the other hand, according to other hadith, uh, the Prophet Muhammad allowed two girls to play music and sing during the Eid festival. So, uh, according to this, Gamalan is more problematic because. Uh, Stringed instruments are always part, like uh, not always, but uh, you usually have rebab and chanampu maybe as well. Um, so this is forbidden. Uh, flute, suling is also uh, in connection with Satan in the hadith. Mm, but 
there is still room for it uh, as an example of religious festivals, like as Muhammad also allowed uh, the girls to play. Uh, and the main, the main importance, but well, one of the most important uh, aspects of Gamelan is uh, during, for example, the Sakaten ceremony or other religious festivals. So uh, in uh, base of this, Gamelan could still be protected by the traditionalist Kirais. And we can see this. For example, there's the Suluk Seh Abdul Salam, which is uh, talking about uh, Gamelan. Uh, and its strong connections with Islam. So it has a, it's a, a strong symbolism which connects Gamelan with Islam in this suluk. Uh, and it states that Gamelan is a very good and very Islamic music indeed. But the existence of this suluk also shows us that uh, there was a very, very strong debate if it's if allowed or not. Uh, the Nahdat al-Ulama is, uh, is protecting these legends. Uh, uh, by protecting Gamelan, uh, according to legends about the Wali Songa, of course, which we all know, and the Kitab Kunings, mainly relying on Al-Ghazali and al nawawi and new commentaries of these books stating that it is useful music. Uh, for example, there's the Fathul Qari Aqarib al-Mujib, which uh, also talks about useful and useless music. Or another example, the Fathul Mu'in, which state that useless instruments are even allowed if we don't play on them. This is a very interesting uh, note from uh, Al Malibari, uh, but uh, it still says that even the instruments are allowed uh, to have if they are useless as well. Uh, the most important thing which we have to note, not just about gamelan, but mainly about all the arts uh, we have in Java, is that there are no explicit mentions of the main instruments uh, in gamelan, like Kurto, Bonan, Gandhar, and all of these. Why? Very easy. Uh, all of these Kitab Kunings were written in the Middle East, very far away from Java, and uh, centuries before the Javanese embraced Islam. So uh, it is virtually impossible to find anything connected with gamelan in any Kitab Kunin, actually. But uh, of course, we can use the analogy, the Qiyas, as they say in Arabic law, in the Islamic law, sorry. Um, and, but the, every argument based on Qiyas is never a strong argument. So uh, there is a very big uh, uh, range how different Qiyas can interpret different sentences from different books, even the same sentences, could be interpreted in a different way because you will find no exact, explicit mention of instruments which you can be found in the gamelan, only similar instruments, uh, but they are not the same. Uh, Muhammadiyya, uh, the beginning was uh, kind of against gamelan, we can say, but today they are accepting that and music in general. They are even making their own musical albums, although it's not gamelan, but uh, it's important that they acknowledge that music can be useful. Uh, the new radical groups uh, are against Gamelan because of its Hindu origins and stating that it destroys Islam. And they even condemn any kind of music saying that it's not part of Islam. And they even state that Muhammad was against music. We had this hadith before about the Ma'azif uh, stating that every stringed instrument is forbidden. And they have another interpretation of this exact Arabic word, the ma'azif. In their interpretation, it means every kind of instrument, which is actually not really uh, uh, um, precise, but they understand it this way. And on the base of this hadith, for example, they try to ban every kind of music. OK, this is about uh, gamelan. Let's go on and see the Wayang theater. So what we can find in the Kitab Kunings about the Wayang theater, or more precisely, what can we not found, but what sentences could be interpreted uh, in connection with the Wayang. The short sketch, Wayang originates either in Java or it came from India. There are different theories. I will not go into these now. Uh, in Hindu times, it was always connected to religious ceremonies. Uh, its stories are mainly from ancient Hindu epics, even today, like the most uh, famous ones are, the most popular ones are Ramayana and Mahabharata, as we also know it. 
the Tantu Pagalaran, which was written in Hindu times, also states that Wayang was invented by the gods, like the Brahma and Iswara. Uh, Islamic legends also, they connected with the Wali Sangha, like the Wali Sangha used Wayang as a medium to spread Islam in Java. Uh, but the main in inventions attributed to the Wali Sangha and the people uh, connected with these stories, already existed in the Hindi period, actually, like uh, different sunans were uh, attributed to put jewelry uh, to the figures or the blanchong, the bog, kayon, uh, that these were all introduced by sunans or, for example, the kayon, and according to the legend, was introduced by uh, Radham Prata. But we can see kayon, for example, depicted on chandus and even the panakawan which is attributed to Sunan Kali Jaga. The first, if I'm not mistaken, the first mention of the Panakawan is from the Gato Kachasraya, written in 1188. Um, and uh, can, we can also meet the Panakawans in Chandis. Uh, so this is uh, interesting. Even the story of Sunan Kali Jaga altering the shape of the figures cannot be confirmed if we read the Kitab Konings. Uh, just for a small uh, reminder, so the story goes that uh, Sunan uh, Giri uh, told Sunan Kali Jaga that uh, Wayang is problematic because it depicts human beings and the depiction of human beings is forbidden in Islam. Uh, and that's why Sunan Kali Jaga made the uh, figures become different, like uh, long, they made the, their, he, he made their arms longer, reaching the knees, their waists too thin until it uh, was already like unrealistic for a human being, knows his beak and so on. And after this, Sunangiri was happy saying that, okay, these are already not people, they are like monsters, so it's fine to use them. Well, first of all, I would like to state that in Islamic law, in fiqh, there is no explicit ban on depicting humans. Uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, difficult topic, uh, even for Islamic scholars. Uh, it is mainly makruh. So makruh is a thing which is not forbidden explicitly, but, it, but if it's better to avoid it. So if uh, you can avoid it, you should avoid it. But if uh, you think it's necessary, for example, in this case, teaching uh, or the spreading Islam, uh, you can do it. Uh, if we look into the Ahya Ulum al Din, the most important book uh, which was uh, in circulation during the time of uh, the Mak, uh, Al Ghazali writes uh, that clay dolls which depict animals should be broken, and textile objects with pictures of animals in it can be legally sold as well, but watching them is not allowed. Of course, we watch Wayang, uh, so that uh, should be a problem, but it doesn't talk about leather. Uh, Wayang Kulit is made of leather, and he could have written clay, textiles, leather, and so on, but he didn't. He only wrote clay and textile. So based on this, Wayang cannot be uh, banned even there's no mention about human beings in the book. In the whole book, there's no mention about human beings. He's talking about animals, not depicting animals in clay and textile. So this means that according to the main Kitab Kuning read during the time of Demak, um, the story of Sunan Giri telling Sunan Kalija that you should not depict human beings is not uh, that much credible. On the other hand, Sacred Hindu texts forbid the depiction of gods and heroes as normal human beings, like the Brahat Samhita, the Vishnu Dharmottara, and others. Uh, they even state that they should have long arms, reaching the knees, extremely thin waists, and so on. Um, in light of these, uh, these uh, uh, special iconographic uh, specialties of the figures might have already been uh, so they might not even connect to Islam, they might connect to Hinduism, actually. Uh, this special iconography is also present in some old Javanese Hindu temples, not all of them, but for example, Chandi Jago or Chandi Sukuk, if we uh, see the, the reliefs there, uh, you can already find these very long, um, thin-waisted uh, uh, figures. So, in general, we can uh, state that at the time of Dema, there was no Kitab Kuning, which could be a basis for banning Wayang at all. 
So the story of uh, uh, having this debate is, uh, has to be like reconsidered. But Wayang, of course, did become very Islamic. Uh, there is no, no, no denying this because many details were changed in the stories. Like we know the Kalima Sada, which was a Hindu thing and that become very Islamic. The death of Salia is also like connected to Islam in an indirect way. Uh, Drupadi become only the wife of uh, Yudhisthira. Srikandi is set as, a, as a solidly female, which in India is not that uh, much uh, uh, sure. Uh, at the time of the Mataram Sultan, there were no new Kitab Kunings which did add to the topic, uh, but there was a debate about Wayang, uh, which we can, be, we can trace in different Wayang books. Uh, there were some people uh, who were not interested in Islamizing Wayang, like the writer of Kitab Manik Maya, but others uh, wanted to connect with Islam and the Arabs. Uh, the writer of the Kitab Konda, for example, is really uh, trying to uh, like marry Hindu gods with uh, prophets of Islam and uh, giving stories, uh, very innovative stories actually, but uh, he really wants to uh, show that Mwayang is really Islamic in nature. Uh, the legend of Sunan Kali Jaga shaping the Wayang and inventing the Panakawa, which we were talking, also appeared, which shows that there was already some kind of debate. So we, 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 the people needed a story uh, which was uh, connecting uh, Vayang uh, with Islam. Uh, so the need to legitimize Vayang in these uh, uh, Islamic times already arose. In the colonial times, the story of Amir Hamza and his Vayang, given it an Islamic story, which is still Javanese in style on the other hand, the story of Devaruchi also mixes the two words, so the people who know this uh, know this as well, that it's a Hindu story, but uh, explained with Sufism and Sufi uh, terminology. Uh, the Minhaj Talibin, the book of Annawi, which was uh, very important in colonial times, states that no animals should be depicted in an intact form. The head should be cut off, so if they would come alive, they would be already dead, so they couldn't move. This is a very important part. Uh, by this, he means that uh, beings having a soul should not be depicted, but humans also have a soul, uh, but he states only animals, so this is a bit tricky part of the book. Uh, but what is the problem? The problem at, uh, that uh, the Vayan figures are moving, right? And they are intact, they have a head. And here there is no mention about leather or clay or, 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 or text or anything, just in general. These, these beings with the soul should not be depicted. Uh, so the story of Shunan, Shunan Kali Jaga becomes problematic again in colonial times uh, because the wild figures are moving. And the Sarat Chimpini also shows that the debate exists, uh, that existed at these times that uh, it exists that in, on the basis of these are depicting uh, beings with a soul, there are enemies of Wayangs among different Santris and Kyais, but this book in general protects it uh, on a symbolical basis. Um, it says that uh, through Wayang it's easier to reach God because it, depact, it, it depicts how the word uh, uh, is and that we can uh, get closer to God uh, through uh, Wayang. So we see that there was a debate, there were enemies of it, but there were a lot of people protecting it. In the 20th century, the Hadith literature gave also new arguments again. Uh, from these, it was already obvious for the Javanese that people depicting beings with a soul will be punished in the day of resurrection. Uh, angels will not enter a house with pictures of living beings inside, and that all these pictures should be destroyed, as different Hadiths say. Uh, this means, uh, from this is already clear, that no animals or no people should be depicted, yeah? But what about monsters? Yeah, what about the monsters? Because these, as we know from the story, monsters, these figures are not people, not animals. So, the legend of Sunan Kali Jaga becomes necessary again for defending Wayam. So it's like an in and out motive here in Javanese history about this. So, so the legend of Sunan Kali Jaga becomes uh, useful, then it's uh, other people who can uh, have a strong argument against it, then it becomes useful again, and so on. Uh, 
After independence, many new kitab coolings were used, but uh, not many new informations that we can find in these books. Just because I have said, like even with the Gamelan, of course, Wayan was unknown for these medieval Arabic and Persian writers. So we can only have some analogous things. The Fathul Mu'in uh, states that no one should accept an invitation if he knows that the host has pictures of living beings in the house, even if these beings don't exist. Uh, the writer uh, explicitly uh, has an ex uh, example with a, a winged horse, a horse with wings. They, they state that if they don't exist, but they could be existing if they would come alive by, if, let's say, God could have created them. So even these are forbidden to be depicted. So monsters are not allowed to. So the story of uh, Sunan Kalejaga here again, um, becomes problematic again. Uh, but, but the Fatful Mu'in also states that even depicting anything uh, with, a be with a soul is permissible, so it's only makro, it's permissible if it teaches little girls. The story is that uh, girls uh, with dolls are uh, allowed to play because it teaches them to motherhood later. Uh, so it is permissible if it teaches, well, Wayang is used for teaching. Oh, of course, not only little girls, but it is used, it is a, a very important part of education in Japanese culture. So, according to this, the defenders of Wayang have a very strong argument that, okay, it might be makru, it might be uh, problematic, but we use it for teaching. So, Wayang is useful. The Nagatul Ulama also encourages Wayang, emphasizing its role in education. Uh, in the beginning, Muhammadiyah was ambivalent with Wayang. Uh, they stated that it's, while it's not a bad thing, but in general, they did not really encourage it. But nowadays, they encourage Wayang as well, uh, talking about the, its connection with Islam. Um, the radical groups are against Wayang based on its Hindu origins and the depicting of human beings, as we have seen. So they use all these counter arguments. And they also state that it's not even not educating the people, but it has a bad influence on society, like spreading uh, ungodly uh, views and the stuff. This is their point of view, of course. The last topic, uh, the traditional dances, uh, which we will uh, look into. Um, in ancient Java, uh, the medium was always the medium always connected with the ancestral spirit through a dance, so it was very already very important. After the arrival of Hinduism, dances become Indian in style, like the finger movement uh, of the dancers is typically Indian, and even the 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 Tassar and Alus styles of dances in today's uh, dance uh, art in Java is it corresponds. Uh, there is this book, the Natya Shastra. It's a very old Indian manual of dances. The, the last Shatandawa, Kaishik, Arabati, and all of the others uh, are really, really similar to the Stasar and Alus style uh, dances. So it became Indian in style. And let's just state this now. The distinction between courtly dances and folk dances already existed uh, during uh, these uh, Hindu times. Dances are always part of religious ceremonies, as we know from different, uh, different texts. And they were mainly for appeasing gods and telling Hindu stories. Some dances we know today already started being shaped by the end of the Hindu era. Well, of course, they were not the same as today. Like we have mentions of Ronggeng or, or uh, Wayang Wong, or we have no mentions of Bedaya actually, but we have uh, mentions of dances which are really similar to that. So I'm not stating that uh, these dances already existed, but a, a, a primitive form or, or a, more, a different form of them from which they evolved to today, today's dances already started to take shape. Uh, Islam in general is trying to avoid the, even the topic of dancing because uh, Islam is a religion which uh, really tries to uh, be in the life of its believers in every single part of it. And uh, according to Islam, uh, dancing is not part of religious life, uh, which is really different from Hinduism. Uh, and this is why, for example, here in, in, in Java, because it's, its connection with religion as Hinduism it could be a problem. But it's not just in Java, in other countries as well, uh, dancing is uh, 
is uh, looked at something suspicious uh, uh, the, 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 the religious uh, teachers I think uh, think about it as a suspicious thing thing okay. Al Ghazali, uh, if we go into the time of Damak and Mataram again, Masa Islam in Java, Al Ghazali also only talks about its connections with Sufi religious ceremonies, the Samara. Um, he states that people in a religious trance, watched in Arabic, they usually start to dance. And he says that it's better if we don't do this dance during the trance. But he also acknowledges that this is not conscious, it's a trance, yeah? So the, our actions are not conscious actions, so we have no control of it. And in light of this, he states that, okay, it, it cannot be forbidden because we are not, not uh, responsible for, for, for this, it's, it's a trance. And in another part of the book, he also states that being happy is not forbidden. And many people uh, start to dance when they become happy, they start to move or anything. Uh, and uh, showing our happiness to others is not forbidden as well. So in basis of this, in the Ikhya Ulum al we can read that dancing cannot be forbidden because it's just uh, the happiness. Uh, he states that dancing in general is allowed, Mubah. Uh, he says that in some special circumstances, it could be uh, disencouraged, be categorized as makru, but as he says, which uh, literally means that nothing indicates that dancing should be haram. So this is very important. And this was, oh yeah, he also states that if someone starts dancing around us, it's commendable if we join the dance because it's just uh, polite to jo join the dance. So this was a very, very good defense. Uh, for the defenders of traditional dances during the time of Danak and Mataram. So they could rely on Al Hazali every time when Akiai was talking about maybe it's a Hindu thing, it should be forbidden, but look in the book, look in the book, in the Kitab Kuning, it allows us to dance. Uh, during colonial times, uh, the corpus of Kitab Kuning grew, as uh, we know, according to Annawi, the most important, most influential uh, during these times. Uh, a dance cannot be considered forbidden too, as he said. So dancing is in general okay, except if a male dancer is dancing as a woman, muhannaf in Arabic. Uh, while Annawi in general also supports dancing, uh, we know it was common practice in Java for male dancers to dance female roles. So some special kind of dances could be forbidden according to Annawi already. Also, uh, Annawi states that someone cannot be a witness, so someone is not a good Muslim in general, if he usually dances until collapsing. We have spirit possession dances like Kuda Lumping, for example, the dancer usually collapses at the end. Uh, so this is a problematic thing. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, as time passed, as, as from the uh, time of Demak and Mataram, the Kitab Kunings uh, all kind of supported dancing. During colonial times, Annamali is a bit more stricter. So there were already arguments uh, in the hands of the Orthodox uh, Kiais. They could already condemn dances based on Kitab Kunings, while before them, it was much more difficult. But in general, this did not change much because the, from the sources, we know that dances still remain quite important in Japanese culture and actually are still are, they still are. During the 20th century, people started to study the Hadith literature. I have said many times before, but there is actually only one story which uh, can be used uh, in connection with this. Uh, as I said, dancing is not a topic which Islam likes to talk about. Uh, according to the story, um, Ethiopian slaves were dancing war dances with lancing in the mosque during a festival. And the Prophet Muhammad had no problem with it. He even allowed Aisha, his wife, to watch it. So it was, he had no problem with this dance at all. Uh, but actually, this only raises more questions because it's not something very specific. So what should we consider this as a basis of arguments here? So dances are only allowed during festivities or not? 
only the war dances are allowed or not? Only in the mosque or outside of it as well? Or any combination, like during festivities at a mosque or during festivities, war dances, but everywhere, uh, and any combinations of these. So this just enhances the argument. This does not change as much, but it uh, gives more and more uh, uh, arguments, more and more written sources, which an argument could be based on. Uh, Java also had a lot of religious festivals, as we know, and we know many different war dances from different kratons. So according to this, uh, this uh, hadith, dances could be protected very easily. Although, on the other hand, uh, the more strict kiais could state that, okay, but it's uh, not in the mosque, it's not a festivity, or so, or, or, or anything else. Uh, after independence, um, uh, the Kolot uh, Muslims supported dancing, while the modernists were against it, uh, basis uh, on a more strict interpretation and the supposed immoral behavior. They're stating that dancers and dance groups uh, have very immoral behavior. They are doing uh, like uh, uh, unlawful sexual life and drinking alcohol, and uh, it was a problem. Uh, well, they stated it. There's no proof actually. Um, the new Kitab Kunings also have very few plus information about the topic. Uh, uh, the Kashifat Sajjah, for example, it was written by Nawi Bantani. He's a very good Indonesian ulama. I would encourage everyone to read Indonesian ulama as well, because uh, uh, as I have noticed, many Arabic ulama are used, but as I have stated, uh, they are not familiar with the Japanese arts and it's much easier to look at in an Indonesian uh, ulama's book. But the Kashifat Sajjah was written in, in Arabic uh, by Nawawi Bantani. Um, so he states that no one should dance in a mosque except during Sufi Dhikr. This is a bit in contrast with the Hadith actually, um, but he's still allowing it as a, as a religious music. Sufi Dhikr is a religious festival. Well, not a festival, it's a religious uh, practice. So um, it allows this. This means that dancing is allowed in a mosque during religious ceremonies, according to this, or it can be interpreted it like uh, as, 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 as this. And how he forms the sentences in the Kashifat uh, we can also, he does not state it explicitly, but it can be understood as, uh, as uh, dancing outside the mosque is allowed anytime in general. So he, he stated in the mosque at religious festivals, uh, so no one in the mosque, but at religious festivals, it's okay. And this also, uh, um, implies in the way how he forms the sentence that it is allowed outside the mosque in general and not just in festivals. So based on this interpretation, the Nahdlatul Ulama can protect every traditional dance, and they do, and they do. The Nahdlatul Ulama's only condition, so the traditionalist's main condition, that the dancer should dress modestly without showing the parts of her body or his body uh, too much. Uh, but in spite of this, uh, they still encourage traditional dances. We know that traditional uh, Japanese traditional dances, many women dance with uh, their, their shoulders uh, naked, up, up from the shoulders, uh, which is actually uh, in contradiction to what the Nafdat Ulama said. I, I, I have went to Pesan Trent and talked with the leaders there of Nafdat Ulama, and they all state this, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the, they still said that, yeah, traditional dances have no problem with them because it's tradition, it's tradition. Um, yes, the Muhammadiyah was initially against dancing in the beginning, but it has changed by now. Uh, dancing, they state, is not forbidden as it, long as it promotes good behavior and the dancers dance modestly. And they even state, they even use this useful and useless uh, uh, label, which we could see at the music that uh, dances can be useful uh, and these are good. And based on this, uh, they do not attack the traditional Japanese dances, so they are fine with them, but they do not encourage them either. So Muhammadiyah now is trying to, uh, to uh, develop a new dance tradition, uh, which is in their point of view is more connected to Islam, uh, 
but the Javanese, they acknowledge that Javanese traditional dances exist and they do not uh, have anything against them, but they do not uh, that much encourage them. Um, the radical groups are against every form of dance, uh, these new uh, radical groups. In their opinion, it's just a waste of time and money, which a Muslim should never do. Not to mention that traditional dances often tell Hindu stories, like Wai Long, for example, so they should not be staged in their uh, point of view. They say even war dances are not allowed if they encourage drinking and bad behavior. Uh, like the, in the hadith, from the hadith, it was clear that war dances are allowed, but they say they even, even want to forbid that because they say it could uh, lead to, to things which are haram. Another problem of them is uh, women's dances. They state that a, women, a woman should never dance uh, in front of non-family related men, even if they dress modestly and make no erotic moves during dances, an audience can imagine these, and these will later lead to immoral behavior. So uh, we can see how they think, so that even the slightest possibility of something bad will make the whole topic forbidden with the war dances as well. Like it could lead to, to drinking, so don't do it. Uh, the women's dances, even if it's a very modest dance, uh, it could lead to immoral sexual behavior. So it's better to avoid it at all, at all costs. Uh, to support this point of view, they often quote books outside of the Shafi'i tradition. So they not only use this Kitab Kuning, which we used in Indonesia, the old times, but they go to every, we know there are four big mafhabs in Sunni Islam, uh, and they use all of the books, uh, which is, uh, uh, who knows about the different mafhabs knows that sometimes uh, about the same topic, the four different schools have very contradictory uh, ideas and very contradictory verdicts. So it's not always credible. I mean, uh, that someone should decide which tradition to use. Uh, and uh, they very often use opinions of the modern Saudi ulama as well, uh, which are known to be like usually very strict. So uh, they usually uh, uh, try to use that kind of book, which supports their point of view. Um, and it's usually outside of the uh, Javanese uh, Kitab Kuning tradition. Uh, a very short summary. Uh, traditional arts in Java are rooted in Hinduism, as we've seen, uh, they are mostly sacral in nature. They were sacral in nature in Hindu times. Uh, they are not sacral now, uh, but uh, like officially it's stated that they are not sacral, but we still have this atmosphere of sacrality during these performances. With the arrival of Islam, most of these become, became part of local Islamic culture. We have seen all the stories we have and all the hidden meanings, all the, all the Sufistic meanings of uh, mystical meanings of these stories and uh, the arts. Why there is a big corpus of Kitab Kunings, it's very difficult to find sentences which can be related to the traditional Japanese arts. Uh, as I have said, they were written very long ago in another part of the world. Uh, that's a problem. And even the, actually, my, when I was researching, the main problem was finding the parts in these books which are which could be related to arts because uh, fiqh books uh, are very good because they are uh, uh, they have a very good system so now i'm talking about salat now i'm talking about zakat now i'm talking about this one but arts has no section in it uh, so it's very difficult to find them and uh, in many books uh, there are only just a few sentences uh, but this gave, gives place to a wide range of different interpretations, as we have seen. On the basis of the same sentence found in the same book, the different people can describe it as supporting their point of view. And this was always like this in Java, and I think it will always be. Now that the ulama and the traditionalist Muslims try to protect every old tradition, based on the tolerant interpretations of Kitab Kunings and on legends of the Wali Songo. It's a very important part of their argument, the Wali Songo. Uh, the Muhammadiyya and the modernists are in the middle of the spectrum today. Uh, they are not uh, criticizing the ancient traditions, but in general, they accept them. Oh, sorry, they're more, 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 more uh, 
uh, they have more criticism, and this is what I want to say. They have more criticism to the ancient traditions, but in general, they accept that they exist and it's not a problem. Uh, but they try to shape their own artistic tradition. It is a, a kind of a new, uh, new phenomena in Muhammadiyya, as I have witnessed. Um, they start trying to new, make a new artistic uh, tradition, which in their point of view is closer to Islam. And then we have the radical groups, uh, which erase everything which is not connected to Islam uh, directly or Arabic culture in general. Uh, no wonder that uh, the critics of this uh, radicals usually call this program like Arabi Sasi uh, because they want to uh, like uh, impose Arabic culture in Java. And of course, according to this, Javanese traditions are not acceptable in their point of view. And uh, but art in general are always suspicious for for the radical uh, thinkers. So it's it's not just because they are Javanese, but the whole topic for them is is very problematic. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this was my presentation. And if uh, there are any uh, questions arose during or anything you would still want to know about, I'm very happy to answer you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mas Aron. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that we still not yet receive any questions, but it is a very interesting experience presentation, Masaran, particularly about uh, some parts which I think it's a contradiction. Uh, so before we continue to questions and answer sessions, as I informed earlier, we will have a photo session together. So to all participants, uh, please open or turn on your camera before we continue to question and answers, because we will have a photo session at the moment. Okay, we have one, um, what fun. Okay, uh, later after the photo session, we will continue to question and answer session. Even though you have not written any questions, you may also raise your hands. Then I will give uh, an opportunity for you to uh, state your question directly to Mas Aron. Bachisa, are we already ready to have the photo session, Bachisa? Yes. Okay, I'll start with the first slide. Second slide. The third one. And the last one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bachisa. And now we will uh, come to the question and answer session. I give, uh, yeah, please, Bapak Ibu, if you want to state your questions, you may also raise your hand while waiting for uh, other to ask questions. We also have first one is Mas what, what Fun. Mas What Fun, you earlier raised your hand. You may state your question, Mas Mongo. Boleh bahasa Indonesia, Mas. Enggak apa-apa. Mas Aron bahasa Indonesianya bagus juga loh. <laughs> Bisa juga. Monggo Bapak Ibu. Halo. 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 Good afternoon. Eh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Michelle Aron. Ya. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, because this uh, this uh, connection is uh, not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I will asking you about uh, what kitab kuning have you been researched in Indonesia? 
there are so many kitab kuning that we, the santris, that we learn, that we, uh, that, that we memorize it, such as uh, Julumia, about about uh, Julumia is about uh, Nahu, Islamic, uh, Arabic uh, language. So about Fiki, many of us uh, study uh, Fatul Qarib or Fatul Mu'in that that's uh, have you presented before Fatul Mu'in? Yeah. But uh, yeah, Fatul Mu'in. Uh, uh, many of us uh, in uh, many pesantren okay, thank especially you, uh, Mas Watpan. so Mas Aaron what types or what kind of kitab kuning that uh, you used in your research and probably whether those kitab kuning also related to any particular uh, Islamic boarding in Indonesia yeah, Islamic boarding yeah, yeah. Salafia Shafi'iya mostly Yes. Salafia is Shafi'iyah and the Islamic modern Islamic boarding school didn't teach it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Maswat Pan. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, as we know, like the Kitab Kuning have, have a very big corpus actually in in, in Java, um, but uh, most of the I mean, like the Kitab Kunings can be uh, categorized. There are different books. There are about fiqh books. There are usul al fiqh. Uh, there is uh, hadith books. There are uh, tasawwuf books. Uh, many, many different kinds. And um, just a very few uh, segments, a very small segment of it, which uh, is considered about arts. Uh, it's mainly the fiqh books, mainly the fiqh books, and sometimes uh, the hadith uh, books, of course. Um, these are the these were the two uh, main uh, types of the kitab kunings I was researching, and of course uh, the very important uh, like a third it's not a category it's one book is the Ihya Ulum al Din from Al Ghazali, as we know in 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 Shafi Islam uh, Ihya Ulum al Din is uh, one of the biggest uh, big, the most important books not just in Java but uh, in all of the Islamic world where Shafi Islam uh, you can find. The Ahya Ulum al-Din is a very, very uh, prestigious book. Uh, even in other madhabs, uh, they uh, like this book. They don't use it as much, but, uh, but uh, they acknowledge its, its virtues. Um, yeah. Um, so from these uh, books, I could also have to look for many different uh, fiqh books, different hadith books, because not all of them had information about arts. As I have said, um, these uh, books are structured really well in general, but uh, there is no special part for arts in them. So mainly which I could use is the parts of uh, buying and selling things. Uh, some parts at the salat parts, uh, which is allowed for sometimes they state that uh, if there are pictures around uh, someone, they cannot pray and so on. Um, I was also using uh, uh, yeah, Al Ghazali is very, very, very good about this uh, this uh, uh, Sufi part, uh, the Sama. Uh, and uh, also I was using those parts from these books which are talking about um, uh, wait a minute, I have it in English. Um, about about yes about uh, the lawsuits like witnesses what, what, what a witness is credible if and not credible if um, so there were books for example the the at taqrib fiqh which I wanted to use because it was almost as important at the time of Damak uh, as the Ikhya Ulum al-Din but it had nothing to say to me about art at all. So even this corpus should have to be narrowed down to not many books. Yeah, the main book I was using is Ikhya Ulum al-Din, of course, uh, and an Nawawi's Minhaj al-Talibin, which is a very interesting book because the Minhaj al-Talibin is actually just a short summary of uh, an Nawawi's uh, longer book, the Rawdat al-Talibin, which is eight, uh, eight parts, and the Minhaj al-Talibin is just one part. 
but in Indonesia, the Raulatu Talibin was not used in the ancient times, uh, but now, uh, actually, I'm not sure if it's even used today, but I can imagine in some sentence, but uh, it, it was not used before. Uh, so it, only the Minhaj Talibin and, um, and some uh, other uh, books like this. Uh, and the, the time when the Kitab Kuning Corpus grew very big was already at around the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, because of the, the uh, development of communication and development of travel, uh, new books could be brought to Indonesia much easier. Uh, so a lot of new books, but, but uh, in Islamic tradition, in Islamic tradition, we see the, the golden age of, uh, of Islamic sciences around, ended around the 15th century. Since the 15th century, there were no new, uh, I mean, there are many new books, of course, but they could not say anything essentially new. They are mainly, they are mainly uh, commentaries of older books. Many commentaries of older books, uh, sometimes connecting different older books together or, uh, or give some point or just uh, sometimes they are just correcting something from the older books. So they could not give a lot of new things, although we have a very big corpus of Kitab Kunings now, but the information in them is very repetitive, always stating the same things in a different manner. Yes, I was consulting uh, many different books, Fatho Qarib as well, uh, the Kashifat al I have said, uh, the Fatho Mu'in, but there was other, the Muqaddimat al or or uh, many, I, I have a list of them, <laughs> but it, it is law, it's a lot, it's like, it's like 20 books, but they didn't say anything essentially new. There were some books which were really good, like the Yahya, the Minhaj, and, and, and others, but they did not state a lot of new things uh, in general. Yeah, I have been, for example, in, in Pesantran, in Krapiak, in Jogja, I was uh, talking about what books do they use, I try to use those. Uh, I also went to the Muhammadiya Center in Jogjakarta, uh, talking with uh, them, and I was also asked them of what do do they use. Uh, I also about the radicals. I was mainly consulting their different blogs and internet pages where they were like describing on what on what uh, basis do they condemn this and that. And there were a lot of good sources mentioned. So yeah, these were the books I was mainly using. I don't know if this answer is, uh, is uh, uh, this is what you were waiting for. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Mas Arad. So I noticed that the Kitab Kuning is seems like it grew and have adjustment according to particular era. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and we also continue to the next question because it's related. Uh, in here, we have okay, Pak Ali Akbar. Mengapa Muhammadiyah belakangan ada perubahan sikap yang lebih longgar terhadap seni budaya? Sejak kapan dan siapa tokoh Muhammadiyah mempengaruhi perubahan ini? Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Saya jawab dalam bahasa in, in, in Indonesia atau bagaimana? Yeah, because in your presentation, you said that you said that Muhammadiyah and modernists are in the yeah. middle of spectrum, right? Yeah. I understand. I'm just asking if I should answer in English or in Indonesian because the question was in, in Indonesian. So, I, which language should I use? <laughs> okay. So, would you like to answer it? Uh, these questions, since when and who's the particular actor of the yeah. changes of Muhammadiyah? Yeah, but should I? Say it in English because the question was in Indonesian. I can. You, you may answer it in Bahasa Indonesia, Mas Aron. Okay. Uh, jadi begini. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we have Bapak David Straker from Ohio, America. If you answer it in Bahasa Indonesia, it seems that Bapak David Straker cannot understand okay. it. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, so I'll answer in English then. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So yes. Uh, Muhammadiyah, uh, why did this change happen uh, is a very interesting uh, question. Actually, I can also just guess 
Uh, it happened during the 80s, I have to say. Yeah, before the 80s, Muhammadiyya was a very, very strict, uh, very strict uh, organization, and it was very much uh, against a lot of traditional arts. Sometimes, even, uh, even uh, in a more aggressive way, uh, I have to say. Uh, but today, it completely appeared, and they are very, became a very tolerant and very moderate organization. Uh, the change took place somewhere around the 80s, somewhere around the 80s. Mm, uh, Actually, it started at the 70s, okay? I, it started at the 70s, but it became more widespread at the 80s among the members of Muhammadiyya. Um, I recommend there's this very good book uh, from uh, Mitsuo Nakamura. Uh, is the title is the, the Crescent Rises Over the Banyan Tree. It's talking about Muhammadiyya in Kota Gade in Yogyakarta in the 70s. Uh, it was written in the 70s. Mm, and uh, uh, this writer uh, or, or said that there are already a lot of, uh, lot of uh, members of Muhammadiyya who starting, started to become very tolerant, but there were still members who were like, still very, very strict. Um, there it was Baba uh, A'er uh, Fakhruddin, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the leader of Muhammadiyya those times, who started these? Uh, I had, uh, I had, uh, I was very lucky. I could make an interview with his son uh, in Muhammadiyya, and he also stated that his father really liked, uh, liked, for example, gamelan, uh, and uh, he was also playing wayang and using the wayang uh, metaphors in their speeches about Islam. Uh, so it was around the time in the 70s when it started but it was the 80s when it became really widespread. And it was only the 80s we can say that Muhammadiyah is already like a very tolerant organization and it's still very tolerant today. Now they are even working sometimes together with Nada uh, which could be like uh, unimaginable during the two world wars. Um, during the two world wars, uh, uh, Muhammadiyah even refused to go to pray at the same mosque as, as, as Nada Thulama. So it was very, it became very different. And why? Ha, people can only guess. I think because Muhammadiyah was uh, trying to reform uh, Javanese society from its roots, but it, it, it cannot be done because arts are so much deep uh, in Javanese culture. Um, like, let's say the Wayang is, it's, is the main, it's one of the most important forms of education. People learn how to like small children, the good morals and everything. Uh, it's just just impossible uh, to to make it disappear from Japanese culture. I think Muhammadiyah must have realized it, and then they had this. Uh, I think it was 2012 or, or before, but uh, they had this brochure where they also stated this uh, Islam yang prakamajuan. Uh, this is their new motto, which says that Islam. Uh, has local varieties all over the world, and it's not a problem. So this is this is not not a problem. It's okay. Yeah, this is uh, this is. Uh, I think this is the the reason of it, of why. But it's a very complex thing, actually. I think yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Aaron. So you said that earlier in your presentation that Wayang related to a part of educational information in Java. Sorry, uh, there's Azan here. Uh, okay, I just uh, tried to connect it with a question by Mas Widodo from Pune Semarang. Uh, he asked whether Wayang in the Kitab Kuni, is it uh, related to all kinds or all types of Wayang, or particularly a leather puppet, or is just like related to particular story or prints of the Wayang that you found in the Kitab Kuni? Okay, okay. Uh, well, to answer this, uh, I have to say that in Kitab Kuni, there's nothing about Wayang explicitly. So you can find no Kitab Kunings where Wayang is even mentioned or even anything similar to Wayang is mentioned. It's because uh, these Kitab Kunings, most of them were written 
uh, centuries before uh, Javanese uh, people embraced Islam and very far away in the Middle East, uh, in Syria, in Persia, in Egypt and other parts of the, of the Middle East. So uh, for these uh, authors, Wayang was unknown. He didn't know that it even exists. Uh, so in Kitab Kuning, you cannot find anything. The only thing you can find is uh, mentions of similar things, uh, which uh, some uh, ulama are still applying to. For example, depicting of human beings, depicting of beings with a soul, depicting animals. Um, so the problem with it is that the, if you want to uh, look into Wayang only uh, based on basis of Kitab Kunings, that's impossible. Uh, so there is only the qiyas here, the analogy, which many, many qiyas use. So uh, depicting as, for example, as I have said before, like depicting, uh, 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 depicting uh, animals in textile, you should not watch them. This is what's said, but Wayang is not textile and so on. In some other books only say depicting them is not good. Then it's leather is always should be forbidden, but it's also not really uh, uh, explicit because most of the times it's just categorized as makruh and not haram, uh, which in general is still permissible. Uh, yeah, the, if you want, really want to uh, dive into the different lacons and different, uh, different types of wayang, it's much more useful to read the wayang manual books. Like the uh, Kitab Kanda, Kitab Manik Maya, or or uh, others like the yeah, so many di di different books which are which are talking about specific Wayang stories, and it's also uh, might be very useful to read the Sarat Chantini. Sarat Chantini is a very very useful information about the time of 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 uh, beginning of the of the nineteenth century. Um, because it talks about, uh, ex explicitly talks about Wayang and its connection to, to Islam. And there might, you might find some, some specific Lacan's different stories, yes. Okay, uh, Mas Aron, I, want, I, I know that the gamelan cannot be separated with Wayang and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So in here, Mbak Rurani Adinda asks, oh, what is the background of Bali Songo use gamelan as medium of Islam religion spreading? And if I want to connect it with the next question by uh, Mbak Astri, whether this only in Indonesia, but also in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh... So first, the gamelan question. Uh, well, we have stories. We have stories, a lot of stories. For example, I think the one who is most connected, the, the, the Sunan who is most connected to, to gamelan is Sunan Bonan. Uh, because it's said that Sunan Bonan was spreading Islam. So the legend say, says that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, using the old Hindu uh, musical ensemble, which is gamelan, and he was, uh, playing it, so people were attracted to his music because they really liked Gamalan for many generations. But his songs were made uh, Islamic. So in the songs, he was teaching Islamic, uh, law, is, 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 the Islamic religion in general, yeah? In Muslim, uh, Islam in general. And that's why uh, a lot of people were listening and they, they went home, they remembered the lyrics and that's how Islam spread. Even uh, there is uh, this instrument inside Gamalan, even called Bonan, many times it's uh, attributed to Sunan Bonan. So the legend says that it was he who invented this instrument and the like. Other very, uh, I think very known story is the Sakatan festival. Sakatan is, 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 is played at, at Maulid, so the birthday of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Sekatan in Jogja and in, in Solo, even today, it's the uh, biggest religious festival, uh, one of the biggest religious festivals, where the, the sacred gamelan of the Kraton is played on, on the Alun Alun, uh, and uh, it's been played for seven days, and people come and, and listen to it. And the story says that it was 
Mm, it's, it's, it's attributed to different Sunan. Sometimes it's Sunan Kalijogo. I have even read Sunan Bonang and, and uh, one other, I forgot. But the most important thing is that it was attributed uh, to that because, uh, because the same story as with Sunan Bonang. So people got interested in the music, but it had uh, Islamic uh, lyrics, Islamic things to teach, and people remember that. And there is a lot of symbolism about gamelan. Like the, there is the pelog and the slendro gamelan. So the different uh, numbers, uh, the seven and and and, uh, and the five. Uh, the five is that the five. It, the, the five can mean the the five uh, pillars of Islam as well, or the five prayers a day, um, and and so on. So there is a lot of symbol. Even like they say that the the gandang is like the imam. Uh, say, saying the prayer first, and all the other instruments follow it. So that's 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 the the rakyat who's like also praying. So there's a lot of lot of connection of gamelan with Islam, um, which was definitely uh, an acculturation of 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 the old and simple to Islam. And the second question was, uh, yeah, if Wayang happens in other parts in Southeast Asia. Well, yeah, yeah, and the, the, the Swayang in Southeast Asia also originated or related to Hinduism. Oh, um, yeah, you can find uh, Wayang in uh, like think similar to Wayang. I have to say, I have to think similar to Wayang, like uh, in Indonesia. In, in no, Wayang in Indonesia and in Malaysia is is okay. We we know about that. Southeast Asia, yes, uh, in Thailand, for example, there is the Nang. Uh, which is very, very similar to Wayang. It's very, very similar to Wayang. And they also uh, play, they mainly play, play the Ramayana. So Hindu story, yes. So it is it is related to Hinduism, of course. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. But from other parts of Southeast Asia, actually, I don't know. But, but uh, I know from India, for example. So there are very similar shadow theater in India uh, as Wayan, um, and uh, but it's not as widespread as because in Java, like Wayang is one of the most important arts. Yes, but in India, it it used to be important. We know from different sources, but now it's kind of a dying dying tradition. So you can, cannot find it in, in many parts of India. But we have a lot of lot of uh, of uh, books telling about from the old times. Actually, the first mention of shadow puppets in the whole world is from India. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mas Aron. And I see that Ibu Bini Bukhori raised her hand. Ibu Bini Bukhori, you may state your question, Ibu. You may open or uh, turn on or turn off your camera. It's also possible. Mongo Ibu. Ibu, mungkin bisa di unmute. Please unmute your... Uh, Button first, Ibu, before speaking. Yeah, okay. All right. Selamat sore, Maturnuwon, Jeng Widya, Sampun Dipun Paringi Wakta, Mas Aaron, selamat sore. Um, I'm pretty new in this uh, topic, and it was for me very interesting presentations. As I was listening to you, I was, I was, uh, also wondering, given the fact that up to now, the Javanese uh, cultural still alive and kicking, <laughs> would you say <laughs> that their ecosystem is not related or influenced by Islamic teaching anyway, or is that a very simplistic conclusions? And mm -hmm. in my observation, uh, Mas Aron, is what is um, now the barrier for the Javanese culture expression, is especially in the dance costume and everything, is our new law of anti-pornography, anti mm -hmm. which of course you know the history and everything. So do you have any opinion on that? Thank you. Okay, uh, well, the first uh, is that, uh, so you want to know the, the first question if, if uh, the discussion is changing, or not, and it's uh, really connected to like the Islamic. Yes, I think I think um, it's 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 uh, reconnected to Islam. So uh, the the 
we have all these stories. Uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, they, these, these stories appeared because uh, people felt the need uh, to, 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 to protect these art forms uh, from, let's say, more strict religious leaders who saw it as something un-Islamic. So, so uh, people had to, had to make stories like so the story of Sunan Kalijaga, for example. Uh, which was always in and out, in and out, sometimes useful, sometimes not uh, in history. Uh, also, as I have mentioned, the different changes in the Wayang for of the different, uh, different characters, uh, Hanuman and, and, uh, and the Sri Kandi and the others. For me, the most interesting is the story of, of the death of Salya, which in India, Salya dies, or there's Shalya, he, 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 he dies because Yudhisthira just kills him. But I have seen a Wayang story where, where he was like, uh, Yudhisthira read the Kalima Sada and that's the, uh, uh, a demon appeared and he killed Salya because he cannot die. But the Kalima Sada is like the Kalima Jahada. So it means that Islam is stronger than the, than the Hindu magic. So yes, I think it's, it's very much, very much uh, forming. Islam is very much forming Javanese arts. And we also have to remember that the so-called classical Javanese arts uh, are got their shape of today during the, the colonial times, during Jogjakarta and Surakarta and so on. So they were formed in a in a very Islamic environment. So yes, while they are uh, still very much uh, Hindu in their nature, uh, their form, their 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 uh, message, and everything is very Islamic. So yes. About the debate, uh, which the different uh, different uh, law, uh, not law, so uh, different KIs uh, have, uh, pro and contra. Mm, I think it does not really changes. Mm, so from the beginning to the today, sometimes you have more arguments coming in, in, in into the debate. So because in the beginning there were very few books, very few kitab kunings which could be basis of an argument, but it's more and more. They are in general not saying many new things, but they can make the argument more colorful. That's, 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 that, that, that's for sure, that's for sure. And uh, um, your other question, oh, this, this law, this uh, anti-pornography law. Um, yeah, this, this can be a problem mainly, mainly with dances, uh, I think. Uh, it, it can be a problem because well, um, it's very interesting actually for me that uh, a lot of uh, actually a lot of traditional dances uh, could be like categorized uh, according according to the to the law, like how it's phrased, could be categorized as pornography. Yeah, uh, but people are still dancing it, people are still watching it, people are still learning it. So I always felt that uh, the Indonesian. Uh, in Indonesian people in general are much more supportive to their traditions than any written law or anything else. Like uh, everyone can say that, no, it's forbidden, please don't do that, or, or even put it in a law. Uh, this, no, it's, it's, it's just not happening because people are more, Indonesian people are more tolerant in, in, in general than that. Uh, I remember, I remember when I was, I was, uh, it was in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. I was in Indonesia at the time when there was this uh, fatwa that Muslim people should not should not uh, uh, use any attributes of other religions, like uh, like uh, Christmas tree or 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 uh, I don't know, like the mooncake uh, or or anything. But I remember it was around Christmas and all of my friends were just helping their, Christmas, their Christian friends to celebrate. And it was such a nice thing actually in my point of view. But this also means that, that people are much more tolerant and much more, much more uh, uh, supportive uh, with each other than I think any written law. And while yes, this might give uh, some difficulties in maintaining uh, traditions, but well, I don't know. I'm very optimistic about this. I, I, I think that in general, it's just going to be to be thrive and evolve. Yeah.
Thank you, Ms. Aron. So your optimism mm -hmm. seems to uh, what makes the Japanese people support this culture, yeah, Ibu Bini, yeah? Mm, yeah. Even, I, even you said there's a fatwa, but for me personally, I like Christmas tree. It, uh, I mean, <laughs> yes. December, it feels like joy usually. Yes. Even yes. though it's not directly related to my religion as, is, uh, as Islam, yeah? Yeah. As, okay, so. It not has uh, to be related with your religion to to find it nice and 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 and, and beautiful, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what you mean by Japanese or Indonesian people are tolerant. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, continue with the questions. We still have three more questions, but uh, the first one is uh, Ibu Triwinarti, whether kuda lumping mm -hmm. also written in Kitab Kuning. But I remember that based on your presentation, you said that uh, in Islam, dance or in Kitab Kuning, dance in general is allowed. However, dance which relate to, well, man uh, dance as a woman, like Langer, is forbidden. Mm. While in uh, Kuda Lumping is usually uh, different because some people say to relate that Kuda Lumping is related to magic because there, yeah, there's the, the actors or the dancers, they, they may eat like glasses or something like that. So, uh, have you found any information about it in Kitab Um Yes, uh, with, uh, with Kuda Lumping, um, yes. So, one of, the, one of the problems, which I also, I think, mentioned that, uh, for example, the uh, Minhaj and Talibin states that people should not, I mean, those people who dance until collapsing are, are not credible as witnesses. So in general, they are not a good person. That's what, what he says in the book. Uh, and we know that in, in Kuda Lumping, uh, at the end of after the spirit possession ceremony, the, the dancer collapse many times, yeah? It, it's, it's happening quite often. Uh, so that can be, can be uh, forbidden based on this. Yes, the other problem with Kuda Lumping is the spirit possession. Spirit possession is a very hot topic, not just in Indonesia, but all of the Muslim world. Uh, mainly in Africa, we have a lot of, lot of uh, spirit possession ceremonies, the so-called Zar ceremonies, which are, are a very, very big debate there. I found that in Indonesia, it's, um, it's uh, also kind of a debate, but it's not as, as, uh, as uh, central as other arguments. But yes, uh, if we want to talk about this exact part of it, it has been stated by different, uh, more strict guys that by inviting spirits to our bodies, it's like um, it's forbidden because Islam is a monotheistic religion, and we could only, we can only, only. Uh, um, so God is the only God, yeah, uh, and uh, we cannot pray to other other beings. Uh, but this is a topic which is very. Um, complex, yes, because the ancestral spirits should not be at every uh, case be categorized as gods. And Islam acknowledges the being of spirits, for example, the jinns or the hul and others. So Islam acknowledges that these exist. Uh, they should not be venerated though, but um, if the dancer is like not venerating the spirits, it cannot be attacked. But at the other hand, we also have uh, sasaji and dupa and other things during the uh, ceremonies, and that could be regarded as venerating the spirits. It also goes down to the same thing, like how do we understand, how do we interpret the things which happen during the Kuda Lumping performance. So based on this, for example, uh, a more radical guy could say that, okay, this is not good because this is like venerating spirits. You have given them sesaji and so on. But for example, the Nahdatul Ulama would say that, yeah, you can, you can light that, uh, that, uh, that dupa. It's not a problem. It's just making the air more fresh, more, more, more uh, fragrant. Uh, it's it's not it's, it's it's okay. So different interpretations exist. Yeah, different interpretations of it exist. There are very tolerant ones, and there are very very not not tolerant ones. Yes. 
So your actually your question, uh, your answer really to another question by Kotimatul Husna, Mbak Kotimatul Husna, and she asked about why NU and Muhammadiyah have different views about dance band because you just said that uh, in NU it's it's fine if even the Japanese like uh, turn off the dupa or turn on the dupa and something like that, and uh, whether these different views is also related to the kitab kuning they use because basically uh, as these two big uh, Islamic organization in Indonesia, isn't it that they derive from the same kitab kuning probably? Almost, almost, uh, but not exactly. So uh, the Nahdat ulama is following the old tradition, the old tradition of uh, Javanese Islam, the Shafi, Law school, and they only use the the traditions of the Kitab Kunings. But Muhammadiyah is not, uh, as they told to me, uh, Muhammadiyah is not against Mathab, but it's not using in Mathab. So Muhammadiyah is a bit. Uh, it, it has a relation with the radical groups, which are using every kind of information uh, they can find in every book. Muhammadiyah is the same in this in this uh, in this uh, matter. So they do not only restrict themselves to the Kitab Kunings, which you can find, when, which were traditional in Indonesia, but they use everything. And sometimes they don't even uh, base their arguments on Islamic books at all. But they can use any other books, even by uh, writers of a different religion, if they find that what's inside is, in their point of view, is uh, Islamic. Okay, uh, so it's, it's it's not exactly the same. But of course, they also know the Shafi tradition, and they also use the Kitab Kunins as well. Just their spectrum is much wider than that. It is a bit problematic because uh, different books have very different things to say. Uh, from different schools. So which one you accept is just up to you. Um, on the other hand, yes, it's, it's a much wider spectrum. Uh, and about the dances, how do they, how do they see these dances as uh, permissible or not permissible or the court dances? And uh, for example, as I have said, it's very interesting. I have been uh, talking with the leaders of Enu and leaders of Muhammadi as well. And when I was asking about dancing, they had almost the same argument. They said, both of them said, both, both of these or, 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 or organizations stated that, yes, dancing can be bad and can be good. So we have to see what dance it is like. What, what, what is that dance like, okay? So if it is modest and the dancers do not uh, wear clothes,